Good morning, everyone. Welcome to today's session. Before we could start with our session, um, we can have a word of prayer. Can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Yes, please, Elijah. Our Lord and Master Jesus, we are most grateful to you this morning for the great opportunity to see the day ends, the light of the day again. We thank you for the breath of life that is manifesting in all of us here. Father, we pray, commit this our moment into your hands, O God. We pray that your Holy Spirit come and be our teacher and our guide. Help us to understand and appreciate whatever you is shared with us here in Jesus' mighty name. We pray, commit, Pastor, to your hands, O oh God, granted the wisdom and, Father, the revelation to share with us the mysteries of your word. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, Elisha. Our class is recorded. So today, uh, we're going to study on two very interesting books. One is the, uh, we're starting with the minor prophets. Uh, before I could say, uh, let me, uh, share the presentation with you so that we all can be on the same page. Yeah, so we are uh, we have completed the uh, major prophets on the five books that is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, and Daniel, and now we are moving to minor prophets. So uh, from initially we see that we covered on the Torah, that is the first five books, then we covered on the history books, and then we covered on the five uh, wisdom, poetry, and the praise book, and we moved on to the books of the prophets. Now in the books of the prophets, we completed the five major prophetic book, and now we are moving on to the two minor prophetic books. Okay. So when we when we say about a uh, major prophet and minor prophet, what does it uh, relate to? What does it relate to? Can anyone answer? What is the difference between the major prophets and the minor prophets? Are they very less in, uh, you know, uh, the calling or how is it? Why, uh, why, why have they mentioned like these are the major prophets and they are the minor prophets? Anyone in the class? Anyone? That's okay. Uh, you, uh, you can just answer. Like, uh, what is your view? Hello, ma'am. I am. Can I say? Able to hear you, Elisha. Your voice is a little lower. Hello, please can, can I share my view? Yes, yes, please. Um, I think it is with the content of their books, as in the major prophets uh, wrote more lengthy books and, and the minor prophets. The minor prophets um, privately wrote uh, smaller books. Their books were not um, large in content. That is, that is my understanding. Yes, Elisha, well said. Thank you so much. You exactly said uh, the right thing. Yes, uh, the message in that book, um, you know, the message, uh, it's not that uh, less important or no, but the size, the content of the book. Uh, the major prophets as the content was much higher. They had many chapters in that book. Well, the minor prophets, yes, the message is very equally important to the major prophets, but then it was not, the content is much, uh, not a much uh, 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 bigger as compared to the uh, major prophets because the contents were less in these books. They have categorized them as the minor prophets, but not in the attribute wise or, you know, there was something called major prophets or minor in this case 
detail or the way they ministered no not at all the message is equally important they all were in the same level ground it's just on the content which has been recorded they have categorized okay so with that we will move on to study the book of hosea well the book of hosea is a prophetic book and it has 14 chapters and uh, the author of this book is hosea himself and the very theme of this book we see is the unfaithfulness the sin and forgiveness and uh, we also see the condemnation for unfaithfulness and there's uh, prophecies relating to Christ and the latter days. And uh, the major character in this book is, uh, yes, God. Second would be Hosea and Gomer, the couple in this book where uh, God, uh, you know, uh, compares them to Israel and himself, okay, figuratively, and the three children, Jezreel, Lo Ruhama and Lo Amin, and then the kings of the northern kingdom. Well, Osea, whose name means salvation, and he ministered in the northern kingdom of Israel, also called as the author also calls uh, the northern kingdom as Ephraim uh, or after its largest tribe, or some places he also mentioned it as Jacob. So the names called Hosea. Joshua and Jesus are all derived from the same Hebrew root word, which is the word Hosea means salvation. God's messenger, Hosea offers the possibility of salvation is only the nation will turn from idolatry back to God. So the book of Hosea is, uh, it has 12 uh, twelve not 12 sorry uh, the uh, uh, the minor the minor uh, prophets are uh, the 12 books of these minor prophets and these 12 books are called um, you know uh, then uh, like they have a important message uh, they have a calling and they have an important message to share with us and that's the reason they have been included in the old testament and uh, yeah the book of hosea were written hundreds of years before daniel and is addressed to the northern kingdom of israel well the book describes uh, the early years after israel became divided kingdom with uh, Jeroboam as second and uh, running in the north uh, and Uziah ruling in the south. And the names of Israel was uh, Ephraim in those days and Samaria and also refers to the northern kingdom. And Hosea sent a prophet around 750 to 700 BC. These are the time period that he lived in and when the apostasy of his people became manifest. And God sent him to condemn the people's sin and call them back to true God, call them back to himself. And the Lord made Hosea's family uh, into a living example of God's relationship to Israel. Well, uh, in the book of Jeremiah, we see how God portrayed himself as, uh, you know, a, a father carrying a heart of a heart for his children. We see the father's love demonstrated through Jeremiah's uh, life where Jeremiah cried and wept looking at Israel uh, rebellion nature in them and he wept so we he is also known as the weeping prophet and uh, you know we see the heart of father in the life of Jeremiah then when we studied um, the book of Isaiah, yes, he um, he also uh, yes he also uh, spoke about the rebellion nature of Israel, and we see how he gave a hope message of hope, like the Messiah's message that Messiah Isaiah portrayed. But in the book of Ezekiel, we see how God made Ezekiel to enact 
every message that Ezekiel shared with the people of Israel, every prophecy, when he wants to share it, he shared it uh, with uh, with an uh, he enacted it by tying his hand, tying his leg, or shaving his beard and burning it them, or breaking a clay pot. Many many demonstrations. We saw how he demonstrated. Okay, but then Hosea is something very different. The way he prophesying to the people of Israel. Uh, and, Pastor, one second. Yes. Can please. you please admit Divya? I think she is late. Okay. Okay. Did Divya join the call? Okay. Just give me a minute, please. Were they able to join? Yeah, they are joining now. Okay, I guess most of them have joined. Okay, so those who joined much later, uh, we started the class with the introduction for the book of the Minor Prophets. Yes, the has joined, Rosalind has joined. Good. Good, good. Okay, so those who join much later, I'll just give you a brief intro. We were studying about the book of Hosea. We were uh, talking about the starting of the minor prophetic book, and we're starting with Hosea. If time permits, we will also uh, cover Joel. Well, uh, Hosea is a very interesting book. Okay, he's the author of this book. And uh, we covered about uh, how God is carrying the heart for the people of Israel. And we uh, we studied a little bit brief out about the major prophets, like how uh, Jeremiah shared the prophecy with people carrying the burden, like the father's love. And um, and later we saw uh, Isaiah shared the prophecies like, uh, you know, the need of Messiah. He gave a word and he said the need of Messiah and he clearly prophesied about uh, you know uh, the coming of messiah and then uh, when we read the book of ezekiel we saw the way how god uh, demonstrated made ezekiel to demonstrate the prophecies like you know tying himself uh, his hands his legs uh, shaving off his beard and the way he uh, conveyed the message to Israel was very different um, in the way, like, you know, breaking the clay board and saying, like, this is how God is going to destroy you. This is how uh, the wrath of God is going to come upon you. You know, many ways he demonstrated. Well, uh, as we studied on uh, on these major prophetic books, we also moving to the minor prophets and we see how God is demonstrate asking Hosea to demonstrate his love for Israel and how he is sharing the message to them where in Hosea's life, it is very different. God is asking Hosea to demonstrate in action. You know, he is going to demonstrate in action the love of God towards um, the people. And here in the very first chapter, we, as we study, we'll see that uh, God is preparing Hosea. Though he is a man of God, he is a prophet, God is saying, listen, Hosea, you're going to demonstrate the love of God. You're going to demonstrate myself, the heart that I carry for the people of Israel. Now, Hosea, uh, just like the other prophets, he is going through his uh, uh uh, you know, uh, uh, he could feel, he could sense the heart of God. He has the burden for the people of Israel. And even he's moved, he weeps, he cries, all that is there. At the same time, personally, he's also been afflicted because when God asks him, you know, uh, uh, to go marry a prostitute, Goma, uh, take her as your wife. He finds it difficult, but then in obedience, in submission, he does it. He does it. And later, when we read the story, uh, you know, I will unveil it, you know, the heart of Hosea, the heart of God for his people. Okay. And also we can see the metaphor, the compare figurative language of how God compares Israelites to Gomer. Okay. Well, the book um, 
God sent him to condemn the people's sin and call them back to the true God. And the Lord made Hosea's family into a living example of God's relationship to Israel. And God commands Hosea to marry a prostitute named Gomer to make an example where Hosea represents a faithful God while Gomer represents unfaithful Israel and adultery uh, which is equal to idolatry at the same time and uh, uh, they have together in marriage relationship they have uh, they have three children and um, you know God is uh, illustrating uh, God gives three name to these three children okay and it's a, it's a symbolic meaning to it let me put that on the chat for the chat i'll just change the slide uh, this is how the book has been divided the first 14 chapters the first three talks about uh, uh, you know the personal life of Hosea, the agony of the unfaithful spouse and later part it talks about the strategy uh, tragedy of an unfaithful People. In the first three chapter talk, talks about, you know, the first three chapters talks about uh, Hosea's marriage, his children, and talks about the separation, and then back to the reunion. Well, uh, later part we see the uh, it, it gives us a model message of Hosea remains true to his wife in spite of her identity, and God is declaring the sin of people and the character of God and. Yeah, it goes on. And the very theme throughout is God's faithfulness, love towards his unfaithful people. And there are some key verses that we can look in. And yes, Christ in Hosea, uh, the portrayal of Christ, the shadow of Christ in this book. One minute, somebody's come. Let me admit it. Yeah. So we see that Christ been called out from hiding in Egypt as a child is pictured in Hosea's record of Israel's exodus from Egypt. And in Hosea's redemption of Gomer from the slave market, Christ is pictured, pictured as the loving, faithful redeemer of sinful humanity. And uh, with this, we will move on to the three children that was, uh, God blessed Hosea and Gomer with. The first son, God gave him a name of Jezreel. It's also a name of a valley or a place in, in that uh, the place where they lived in it says uh it's a son uh god scatters a seed uh because a people of israel they dependent more on the pagan country which god and wanted them but then they depended to the political power of egypt and assyria and because they depended on that assyrians eventually scattered israel and god pictured the defeat in the valley of Jezreel. So uh, God asked Hosea to name his son as Jezreel. And the second child, a daughter, he asked him to name Lo Ruhama, means not loved. God chose his name to show Israel he no longer will love to the house of Israel. God would show love to Judah indeed. Judah this uh, the southern kingdom was called as Judah. The northern kingdom was known as Israel or uh, Samaria, or it was also called as Ephraim or Jacob. There are many uh, ways where the author is calling the northern kingdom of Israel. Well, so the third son he names as Lo Amin, a son, uh, which means not my people. So these are the symbolic names which through which God will be illustrating. Okay, so we'll go back to the book of Hosea, where it says, you know, Hosea lived in the northern kingdom of Israel, which sometimes, as I said, it's called in different names. And in uh, we, we are going back to the book of Kings. Uh, in the period of First Kings, chapter 14 to 17, we see that Hosea was called to speak to the people of uh, people of God, to, to the Israelites on behalf of God, because during the reign of one of uh, Israel's worst king king jeroboam the second the nation was descending into chaos into disaster and in that year 720 uh, 722 the uh, the assyrian empire swooped in they destroyed they demolished israel and uh, again in the story we see that in second kings hosea had seen all of this coming 
the book, uh, the book of Hosea is a collection of, uh, uh, of the story of about 25 years of his preaching and writing. It's almost all the poetry in this book where the whole collection uh, is been written in the three main section of this book or the two main section of this book. Okay, uh, so let's see. So the opening part tells us the story of Hosea's broken marriage to a woman called Gomer and who commits adultery. Now, it's not, uh, okay, and uh, uh, yeah, and God asked him to get married to her, but, uh, and then they had three children and things were not going very smooth in their life, things were falling apart. And the important point here is God is telling Hosea that despite Gomer's unfaithfulness uh, in her marriage life, he is going to find her to pay off her debts. She uh, pay off her debts to her lovers and she had made a credit around whom she uh, committed adultery with and, and she paid the debts and he says, um, you bring her back. You pay, God is asking Hosea to go bring a wife though she left and went and uh, she has uh, uh, committed adultery with many men but God is instructing Hosea go and get back your wife pay off the debts and love her as though she has not sinned the important point here is that God is telling Hosea that despite what she is love her and God says of this the broken repaired marriage uh, the, uh, uh, all the brokenness in this marriage and God is giving a prophetic symbol what is that symbol? the story of God's relationship with Israel no matter what no matter how Israel is you know uh, sinful God's love will never change yes sometimes God is upset God gets angry God's wrath comes upon people God allows other kingdom to come destroy conquer take them into exile all that is there but then is angers for a moment but joy uh angers for a moment but the grace abounds more than god's wrath and we see with ab ab abundance of his grace and abundance of his love god is moving on the people of israel and yes he's demonstrating that love through osia he's saying go love her go bring her back go go pay her debts and bring her bring her back and he asked uh, him to be faithful, even if in spite of her nature, in spite of Gomer's nature, God is asking Hosea, you be faithful. You be faithful to the covenant. I want you to keep that covenant. See, this is what God does with you and me. No matter we are unfaithful, no matter what shortcomings we are going through in our life, or no matter what Israel did, we all know what Israel is going through at this season, that they failed God. They ran after other gods. They were committing idolatry. Uh, where uh, Gomer is coming, the adultery is also compared to Israel's idolatry, worshipping other gods, perverting the nature. They have put the idols in the temple of God and started uh, worshipping the gods of that place like the Baal or other Assyrian and the Egyptian gods. And they're not seeking God and all their nature, but they're running behind the political power of people. And they're seeking them. They're seeking them. So when God saw this nature in them, that there's no first place given to God, but then it's been given to, uh, to Egypt and the pagan people, God is... God's wrath is increased. On this people and yes he gives it to Assyrians to conquer Israel and Assyrians come demolishes Israel, Israel and you know uh, the completely and yes and take them to exile and then we see God's nature of uh, you know trying to save his people and that's when he sends he raises these prophets and he asks them to speak to the people of Israel that one day you will repent one day you will again repent and come back to worship the God so Hosea says uh, he places over them a new messianic king uh, he gives them a future he gives them a hope about 
Christ. He says, uh, there's a messianic king will rise from the line of David, who will bring God's blessing. And so this opening, uh, he opens uh, the idea of a messianic king, a messiah. We are in need of messiah because we have rebelled not against man, but against God himself. So uh, that's the reason we are going through the severe consequences. But then when we repent from our sin, when we repent and God will have mercy upon us. And here he's demonstrating in his life saying um, the, uh, the covenant of love that uh, he made with Gomer. Okay, no matter how many times she runs, but then he will go and bring her back. He'll clear all the debts. We, when we read the story that uh, Gomer leaves him, gets separated, she goes back, uh, you know, into the... Uh, 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 prostitution and then she's been put in the slave market clear demonstration now she is at a price in the slave market with all shame nothing is hidden they all look down upon her people who enjoyed the pleasure with her now they're looking down upon her they are pointing at her for the bad nature she's been condemned uh, she's at the worst situation. She has no hope and uh, she looks herself so much down. She, she's almost like given up on herself saying that everything is over. I've brought shame upon myself and nothing good can come for me. I'm destroyed. Everything is over in my life. At this stage, there's an hope. We may come across that stage. Israel is at this stage, right? I mean, in those days and then we can also relate to ourselves to our situation sometimes we may condemn ourselves so much that there is no hope of forgiveness we may think like even god cannot forgive us for the sin that we have committed and here god is saying there is nothing big that i cannot forgive you there's nothing uh, uh, there's nothing that is much greater than what jesus has died on the cross can cover and and god shows his love that i am a covenant maker and a covenant keeper he sends hosea to keep up the covenant of marriage with gomer when she's in the slave market uh, god sends hosea saying pay her debts clear her debts and redeem her and here he goes pays all her debts redeems her carries her from that shame he carries her and he says i love you just the way i loved you in the first time when i got married to you when gomer is not worthy to look at hosea she feels uh, the shame is covered all over her she says like i'm not worthy even to live you know she is like that but then you see the love of hosea we see that God poured out his love. He's just demonstrating an action. He loves her. He just carries her like that. He says, you are as precious as the day I got married to you and I love you. We see the action been demonstrated saying that I love you with all my heart and I don't see you with any of the sin. Uh, you, uh, I, I love you. I would like to embrace you just the way, just as if that you have never sinned before. We see the justification of God there. And this is the way that God is embracing Israel. God is saying, no matter how far you have gone, no matter what you have done. But God is saying, listen, when you repent, I will just love you. I just love you. So for them to repent, God is raising the prophets. Even that Israel is not ready to do on their own. God is sending, sending his prophets and saying when they are in the exile, God is sending these prophets and telling them, listen, when you repent, there is a hope. There is a future. God will love you. God will save you. God will accept you. God will send a Messiah for to save you and me. Is Time and again, we see how God's love has been showcased. You know, uh, maybe before uh, before we would have had the picture of angry God and us, you know, oh, God punishes, he, he punishes his people. But then when we study in depth, you see God is not punishing the people of Israel. It's their own sin nature is opening doors for these type of consequences. Disobeying 
Torah, disobeying the law of God, worshipping the other gods, going away from God is nothing but you're moving away from the grace of God. It's the grace that protects us from the hand of the enemy. But then when we uh, willingly, willingly move away from God, move away from His grace, that is when we had to face the consequence. And here God is saying that even though you have moved away, even though you have gone away, God is saying, I'm still waiting. We see the Father's love. Again, we see the later part of this book, we see the uh, uh, like the prodigal son, how the son rebelled against the father, took away the uh, uh, um, took away the portion of wealth for him and he went he destroyed and uh, you know uh, he was in a complete trouble and when he repented when he looked at God when he asked for forgiveness the love was restored back to him the relationship of father was restored back to him father hugged him with all his love in fact the father was waiting for the son it's the same picture we see when we read through the book of Hosea like he is demonstrating that God's love like a Father is waiting to embrace us, to restore us back, to restore us back. And he loves us. Though we are unfaithful, though Israel was unfaithful, but here God is a faithful God. He's a covenant keeper. He loves us. So I feel the book of Hosea is only the book of love. God's love been portrayed uh, through Hosea. Today, we may look at ourselves. How are we seeing ourselves? Yes, we have our own weaknesses, but then God is saying, I love you. You may have uh, broken the covenant. We may be uh, living in sin or certain things that we're not pleasing God. But then God is saying, just like the way I asked Hosea to forgive Gomer and accept her and embrace her with the love same way God loves you and me he is ready to forgive us our sins not only ready to forgive but he's ready to restore us back in restore us back to that love relationship that we had with him the first love that even the book of revelation talks about restoration of the first love we can be restored back to him in full And today we see that in, in, in Christ, we have been restored, restored back to him in Christ. When we receive Jesus as a Lord and Savior, Jesus died on the cross for our sins, to forgive our sins. We are sanctified. We have been cleansed. We have been restored back to the relationship that we have in God, where we can freely call God Abba Father with all our heart, with all our love. We have this access that God is faithful to us. Despite our weakness, God has redeemed us back to him. And the relationship is restored back. And today when we live, we live in the identity of the daughter. Identity, uh, identity of God's daughter. His son. His son and his daughter. We are the child of God. And that's what the book of Hosea says. We have been restored back to the relationship that we have with Christ. So with this, we uh, complete the book of Hosea. I uh, open to the class if you would like to add or share anything. And we can move on to the next book. These are some of the highlights. This is a reflection, God's faithfulness towards us in times of our unfaithfulness and our obedience to God when he is asking us to do difficult things for his kingdom, just like how God has Hosea to get married to her. Two things. One, to get married to a prophet was very difficult. And second thing, when she's in the slave market, after even after marriage and after children separated and going back to the adultery, and now God is saying, go pick her up. Clear her debts and pick her and tell her I love you. So these are very uh, difficult things uh, as a human to do, but then by God's grace, God is filled us here with the love of God to demonstrate that. And we see that nature of willingness, submission, obedience to God completely. Now as a servant of God, you and I, God can ask us also to do some things uh, which may be difficult for us 
in a human nature in our situation to do but when when we obey when we obey the scripture says there's blessing in obedience not in sacrifice but in obedience when i say sacrifice not sacrificing some things like not offering anything to god but then talking about you know the obedience being submission submitting to god to what he's saying us to do and when we uh, sometimes it may be very silly things uh, it may be very difficult to our human understanding but then when we submit uh, simply because god is asking us to do just like how God asked Hosea to do certain things. In the same way, it may be different things what God is asking us to do. Maybe very simple, like it can be uh, asking a simple sorry to somebody uh, you may have hurt or maybe that person have hurt you, whatever the reason is. But God is asking you to go and ask an apology. And that is very difficult, not very easy. It comes, you know, asking uh, sorry does not come easy. That's not in the human nature, but that's a God nature. When God's asking us to submit, to restore the relationship, you know, for the sake of God, not for a human sake, for the sake of God. When you submit yourself there and say, listen, I'm very sorry. Not because uh, uh, they have committed mistake or you have committed mistake, just in obedience of God to restore the relationship. When we obey and go, ah, sorry, even if it is not our mistake, and you see the blessing of God in your life, this restoration. Um, it can be any area. I just gave you an example of sorry. It can be any area. God is asking us to step in and do something. And when we uh, do it with all obedience, we see the blessing of God, the hand of God upon our life. Okay. Uh, is there anything that you would like to share? Class? Nothing, Pastor. On my okay. So, yeah. So I will just move on to the next book. Yeah, the book of Joel. So the book of Joel, uh, uh, the Hebrew name of Joel is Yahweh is God. And this name is appropriate to the theme of the book, which emphasizes on God's sovereign work in history. The, uh, the course of nature and the nations are in his hand. And this book is dated 800 BC and it has three chapters. And the book has a theme, the day of the Lord. Day of the Lord, and there's a restoration uh, uh, oaves upon Judah and uh, hope and restoration. Uh, when you repent, there is a hope of future restoration. Most of the prophets have written this there is a hope. When you repent, there is a hope for restoration. And we see the major character in this book is yes, first is God, second, we see the author Joel himself, and then the people of Judah. Now, who's Judah? The southern kingdom. The author's background uh, nothing much has been known about the author, but uh, in the chapter, we see that his father's name was Petuel, he's the son of. Petiol, meaning persuaded by God, with his fervent references uh, to Zion and the house of the Lord. We see that uh, he was uh, uh, lived very close to Jerusalem because of his statements about the priesthood in the book, made in the book. We see that um, you know some of the scholars uh, uh, believe that Joel would have been a priest as well as a prophet. So in this case, Joel was a um, you know he was a uh, he was a prophet and he was also uh, preaching and uh, uh, preaching and asking people to repent so that uh, you know uh, so that uh, you will be saved so that your sins will be forgiven and you will be saved well the very purpose of this book is the uh, coming judgment the plagues it talks about the uh, the plagues of locusts and then famine uh, used as an object lesson to exhort the israelites for the need of repentance and we also see the warning if you do not repent the day of the lord is coming the judgment will come upon you and again we see uh, there's a uh, and we also see that he's exhorting like when you repent there's a days of blessing and there's a days of restoration but if you don't there's a judgment but if you do you'll inherit the blessing well, with this, we will move on to the introduction of this book of Joel. It says uh, it is a short collection of the prophetic poems that are uh, both powerful and it is also uh, 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 a warning. And uh, Joel is a unique 
book among the prophets uh, for few reason first of all they are no explicit indication of when this book was written and <clears throat> It was likely to be known as in the period of Ezra and Nehemiah after the return from the exile because uh, there's a mention of Jerusalem and the temple, but it's not very clear. And um, yeah, with that, uh, we also see that uh, there's a eunuch in this book of Joel uh, uh, is that the uh, the familiars with many other scriptural books. He includes the quotes from the uh, book of the prophets like Isaiah, Amos, Zephaniah, Nahum, Obadiah, Ezekiel, Malachi. So he takes the quotes from all these books and even from the books of the Exodus. And there is a connection that the author is making with the, uh, with the unique features of the plagues that is from the uh, Exodus to now. And uh, that's uh, Joel. Uh, that's how he um, he portrays and accuses Israel of any specific sin that they are committing. So like many of the other prophets, he announces God's judgment is coming to confront Israel's sin. But he never says why. And that's most likely because Joel assumes like, uh, you know, uh, uh, we are reading this book with continuation of other prophets and we know uh, the reason because Israel's rebellious nature because he has been re relating to the other prophets so as when we it is a continuation of other books now and all together we put there are three features that helps us to understand this book is that um, uh, he immerses himself earlier to the biblical writing and with the reflection of them he helps us to understand the sense of the uh, tragedies uh, of uh, israel what they are going through and these are uh, also relating uh, if they repent again and again uh, most of the prophets this is what they say looking at the rebellion nature of israel is when you repent there is a hope and there's a future but if you stay in this there's a judgment there's a day of the lord he's talking about the day of the lord where the judgment judgment will come upon them so uh, this is how it is and we will move on to the chapter wise in chapter one and two joel mainly focuses on the day of the lord the judgment this is a very key theme in the prophet where it uh, uh, where it describes the events in the past when god appeared in a very powerful way to save his people to confront evil uh, and also uh, about the plagues in the book of exodus but the prophet saw in these past events uh, where you know how God uh, when people uh, confronted the evil doing of people and when they repented how they were saved and you know Joel is actually uh, making uh, he is trying to get those reflection reminding the people of Israel listen people rebelled and they were punished but when they repented God was merciful to save them so today when we repent when we repent when we come out of this idolatry what they are and god will forgive and uh, you know you will you will inherit the blessing of god so this is what joel is continuously telling the people and joel also is drawing a, a parallel line to the poems in focus on the theme so in chapter one he talks about the past days that is in the book of exodus uh, how god brought uh, the plagues the disasters and the year the um, again there's a plague of swan of locusts coming into the field and coming into the land and here he says god is sending this uh, in judgment of people so when we repent he can um, he can save us so joel is calling all the elders and priests to lead the people in repentance and pray and then joel actually himself repents he is putting himself in the people of israel and he's saying lord i don't know about others but you i'm repenting for this and and you know uh, he also represents himself as priest so he is repenting and he is saying um, you know save us and in chapter 2 we see that alongside uh, you know in the poet uh, he, he also announces that there is another day of the lord except this time it's future not past and he says that disaster is coming on jerusalem and he begins describing what seems like another wave so there's a second wave of locusts that would come and that will come in the form of you know military and the cosmic imagery of the locusts becoming god's army and you know they'll come to destroy everything that's there and the sun will be darkened and there'll be earthquakes and joel says the day of the lord is dreadful 
dreadful who can stand god's wrath is asking who can endure it so once again we see that joel is warning warning people to pray and repent and he says how to repent rend your heart not your garment not the outwardly putting up the ash and rending your garment or sitting in the sackcloth no rend your heart let your repentance come from within what matters more is your heart condition is your heart attitude is that seeking god is that earnestly seeking god or just for a time moment just to overcome this emotional situation and then go back to the same old thing no joel is saying rend your heart let your heart be changed let your heart repent because god is pleased not at the outer nature not at what you are speaking or saying how you dress but then your heart condition is that truly seeking god is that truly repenting that you will never sin against god you will never go behind other gods uh, because our god is a zealous god jealous god you we need to seek him with all our heart all our heart mind and soul and here joel is making a point to israel saying listen there are many times you have repented but you have gone back at the same time but then now again as the judgment as the day of the lord is here at hand i want you to change repent from your heart repent from within because a uh, god is a god of grace you know god is more gracious and compassionate he is slow to anger and he is full of love you see how the prophet is describing god again and again because in people's mind people look at god as a god who punishes but they are not able to understand it's the sin which is causing the uh, uh, the consequence of what they are going through it is not god the sin nature that they own uh, they own action against god is a consequence of uh, whatever trouble they are going through but then the prophet at the point of time and again the love of god he is describing how much god loves you that god is gracious and compassionate to accept you again to embrace you with all his love you know again there's a message of love in the book of joel showing that god is gracious god is compassionate when we repent when we repent god is gracious to save us to redeem us and there is a future of hope and we see he is also quoting from the book of exodus like how god forgave israel they made the golden calf and uh, you know he he reiterates many story many story uh, from the torah to remind the people that's the reason you know many of the prophets again time and again they remind the story because yes there's many generation who passed by now for us we are reading why so much repeat but then there are many generation who have come and gone come and gone they there may be some of them would would have never heard about god the miraculous things that he has done to save them you know uh, to save them and also to show that god is uh, mindful of israel he don't want to give up on them and we are the people of god to put that word in the uh, in the heart and mind of god so god uh, sorry heart and mind of israelites god raises prophets time and again so it's not only then it's even now god raises leaders god raises pastors all the fivefold ministry and not only that others also and he puts this burden into our heart listen you experience the love of god how i forgave you as how i have redeemed you and i have uh, restored the relationship with you now will you speak for me now today god raise we studied about hosea and we are studying about joel now god is looking at us yes hosea and joel demonstrated my love to people they were ready to share the good news they were ready to share that god is compassionate and merciful when we repent he'll forgive and restore us back now they did now it's your time are you doing it are you ready to share this gospel that i've sent my son they were waiting for the messiah but you and i have got messiah jesus came into this world he died on the cross for us he restored us back but are we sharing this news this good news with others 
can we be that mouthpiece? We don't have to have this fivefold ministry of title saying, I'm the prophet, pastor, teacher, evangelist. No, God is asking, if you believe in me, can you share the good news with others? Can you share the God's love with others? The love with which I loved you. The love with which I have redeemed you, as I restored you, even though you would have broken, uh, uh, broke the covenant just like Gom Gomer, and you've been unfaithful like the Israelites, what Joel is saying. If you and I have done that, and God has restored us back, what is the lesson that we can learn from these two books that we read today is God is calling us, and God is also asking us a question. Will you demonstrate God's love to others? I'm a God of love. I'm a God of love. And I loved you and I restored you back just as if you have never sinned. I died on the cross for you and I have redeemed you. And I will redeem everyone, whoever comes to me. And I'm a God of mercy, grace and compassion. Now, will you be my mouthpiece? Will you go share the good news with others? Yes, Israel rebelled. Israel, uh, the people of Israel never listened to any of the prophets. They were mocked. They were looked down. But in spite of that, they were people who listened to them. They were people who repented. They were people who turned to God. Let's leave that action to God. Let's leave that to God. And let's do what God is asking us to do. Like how Hosea submitted himself, he obeyed himself, surrendered himself to God and just obeyed. Okay, Lord, I will do what you're asking me to do. Just that we should not be very comfortable in the zone where we are. If we are getting comfortable, then there's something not right. Help us. We need to pray. Lord, help me to do what you wanted to do. Help me to go to the place where you wanted to go. Help me to share the good news to others what you wanted to me to speak. Help me to be a mouthpiece. And God, as he said to Isaiah, I'll put my words into your mouth and I will speak the same way. God will put his words into our mouth and he will speak in and through us. God has never failed us. The God who promised Joshua that as I was with Moses will be with him. The same God says, I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. The God who was with all these prophets, even the prophets that we are going to study, the God who was with them is with us. God is saying, will you carry this good news and share it with others? Will you embrace me with all your shortcomings? Because I have embraced you. I love you. And I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So with this, I will leave the class for open to class discussion for five minutes. If there's anything that you would like to share from the learning of these two books, please feel free. Go ahead, share. We are running out of time. I would request one of us to, OK, if there's no question, then maybe we can. Or you can share what you learned, uh, what touched you, uh, what has impacted you, uh, in what way God has spoke to you personally. Because every book has a personal connection with God. God speaks to us, to our heart. The Spirit of the Lord who is with us, he will awaken us with his word. Yes, Dibya, please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Pastor. It was uh, really informative. Um, yeah, uh, as you mentioned in the last, uh, in the book of Hosea, how Hosea obeys, you know, surrenders completely. That's really amazing. Uh, it would have been really tough for him to do that. But yeah, it's, uh, and to show that uh, forgiveness, uh, yeah, that really touched my heart. And also in Joel, yeah, we always, um, quote those scriptures, right, which uh, has been uh, kind of fulfilled in Acts, like, I'll pour out my spirit, out my spirit on all flesh. And I believe that even these days, yeah, it's being fulfilled. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah, just yes, yes. That. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, That is a very important point. Yes, it was fulfilled in the day of Pentecost, and also now that you know, I'll pour out my spirit, and everyone and the young ones will see visions and prophesy. Yes, it is very important. It has been fulfilled. Every prophecy has been fulfilled in and through us in our time as well. Anyone else would like to add on to what Divya said? Anything that we have not covered, because in one hour we cannot cover. But still, I would recommend each of us to go through these books, uh, read, so that we can understand better. Brother Isaac, Brother Elisha, John, please go ahead. Just share if you would like to. Okay, we will end this session with a word of prayer. Can I request John to lead us in prayer, please? I mean, to dismiss pray. us with prayer. Yeah. Gracious Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for the time you've given us to learn from your word, uh, especially from the book of Hosea and Joel. But we pray that uh, we would adopt uh, all the things that we have learned today in our daily lives and help us to have that attitude of coming back to you um, at every time and every situation yes. and to seek your face and to have a restoration and help us also to preach the message of reconciliation to the people yes. as we learn from today's word of God. We pray that, O oh God, that your Holy Spirit lead us and uh, we pray that we would, we would really focus on uh, the vo voice of the Holy Spirit and be sensitive to what you're trying to teach us, O oh God, and help us to reflect this to the people around us, Master. We give you praise. We also set and pass Diana to your hands. Thank you for enabling her to share your word to us. We pray, O oh God, that this week would be fruitful to us and help us to be more rooted and grounded in your word and your love, Lord. Yes, Lord. We thank you, Lord. In Jesus' precious name, we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you, John. <clears throat> thank you. See you all tomorrow. God bless. Have a Ma blessed day. Ma'am, I have one question. Yes, Aradhana. Uh, you gave a final assignment of Old Testament. One second, please. I'll stop the recording.